Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. I'm Fernando Guerra. I am the director of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We established this lecture series over 10 years ago, and we did this primarily for three reasons. First and foremost, to provide an interdisciplinary education for hundreds of our students. Second, it is aired to over one million households like yours in the city of Los Angeles. Third, it also brings together government officials, business and community leaders, our students and others to discuss the challenges being faced by our city. For more information about the Urban Lecture Series, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and Loyola Marymount University, we welcome you to visit our website, which can be found at www.lmu.edu backslash CSLA. We hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we hope it inspires you to get involved in the challenges facing our great city. We have with us today Jack Kaiser. His official title is Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. And we'll ask you what that organization is. He is called the guru of Los Angeles economy by the Los Angeles Business Journal. Mr. Kaiser is responsible for interpreting and forecasting economic trends in the Los Angeles five county area. So he should know whether we're in a recession or not. And for analyzing the major industries of Los Angeles. The five county areas include Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura counties. Um, Mr. Kaiser is, uh, he helps develop job retention and creation strategies for Los Angeles County. And he's frequently sought by business, government, and the media. As a matter of fact, I would say that uh, Jack Kaiser is the most quoted individual in Los Angeles. And I think it's been uh, uh, verified by some uh, um, media outlets that his name is mentioned more in the media than anybody else in terms of uh, uh, analyzing what is happening in LA, uh, LA's economy and just in LA in general. Um, let me ask you very quickly. Uh, what is the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation and how did you end up there? Okay, the LA EDC is uh, officially a 501c3, which means it's a public benefit corporation. And we have uh, three goals. One is uh, analyzing the economy. We have to know what goes on here better than anybody else. And then uh, we have a business assistance program and we have people stationed around LA County who are out actually interfacing with businesses, trying to solve their problems, uh, helping them uh, find to get a permit, find a space uh, to locate their business in if they need to expand, workforce, that type of thing. And right now, you can imagine they have a lot of people calling on them. And then we have uh, what we call our consulting practice, which does uh, consulting on major issues like water, like mobility, things like that. So it's multidimensional. So in consulting, like who would hire you guys or would they give you a grant to study something general or is it very specific for a business that uh, you do consulting? It, it can be very specific. For example, we've done work for something called the Southern California Leadership Council, which literally includes representatives from all of Southern California down to San Diego, which I think is very unusual. Usually San Diego doesn't want anything to do with LA because uh, we're so rude and raucous. But uh, we do work for them. Uh, we do work for private corporations. Uh, we've done analysis of the impact of international airline flights at uh, LAX. It's a pretty broad portfolio. So can we call it a think tank? Yeah, I can think you can call it a I think mean, that's definitely yeah. one aspect of it. Well, it's, it's a think tank, but uh, the advantage that we have when we're thinking is that we can call one of our regional managers and say, what's going on in this area? What are some of the things that businesses are thinking about? And right now, uh, it is, what you say, sort of survival. We had the question, are we in a recession? And it's ironic, I was sort of straightening my office today, and I found my little black cloud. And in the early 1990s, when I went out to give a speech, and it was pretty rough in the early 1990s. I felt I need to have this over my head, so, you know. Well, we didn't want you to bring that with this optimistic group here, but uh, how, did, how did you get to the LAEDC? Uh, it's a very strange story. Um, well, I'm a third generation Angelino, born in Huntington Park, go Huntington Park, uh, and uh, had worked at a couple of banks and then uh, got crazy and moved to Omaha, Nebraska and lived in Omaha for five years, which was very inter interesting because you gain perspective on what people elsewhere in the U.S. think about L.A. Uh, 
you're in Nebraska and you want to go to a Disney park, do you go to Orlando or you go to Anaheim? Most people there would go to Orlando because they perceived it as being safer, not quite so difficult. And then uh, I came back to LA, went to work for the LA Chamber of Commerce, uh, worked there, and then the LA EDC was going through a reorganization. They de determined they had to get serious about economic development, and one of the board members of the EDC was a longtime friend, and he said, well, talk to the new president who came from Cleveland. And uh, so I talked to the guy a couple of three times, and he said, well, why don't you come work for us? And literally job, maintaining jobs, creating jobs is sort of my personal passion, and so it made sense. So how long ago was that? Uh, I joined it in 1991, just before all the fun began. Uh, the earthquake, the civil unrest, uh, major economic restructuring. Um, it's been interesting. We've been talking in class, and we call, talk about the six Ds, and one of those Ds is a disaster that you just mentioned, but another one is what we've talked about, deindustrialization, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the shifting of the economy from a manufacturing to a service or information economy, which really happened in the 50s, 60s. So take the students back to LA in the 50s. What kind of an economy did we have? Uh, it was a very industrial. Uh, you had all kinds of auto assembly plants. We were doing this would you believe yesterday, you know, you had two GM plants, uh, a Ford plant, uh, a Lincoln Mercury plant, a Chrysler plant, a Studebaker plant, uh, if anybody knows what a Studebaker ever was, and uh, a Willys Overland plant, we had steel mills, uh, we had uh, all kinds of aircraft factories. Uh, uh, the economy is very interesting. Uh, how many people have ever looked at what would you say, the, the classic uh, seal of the county of Los Angeles, and that tells you a lot about the history because you have a fish there because it once used to be a major fishing center. You have the oil derricks because you had major uh, oil production here. Uh, you had the cow uh, because we were a major dairy center. Yeah, and we had all, we, would you believe that one time Los Angeles County was the largest agricultural county in the state? That's hard to believe. Also one of the major oil producers, yeah. if you, we're standing here uh, over uh, 70, 80 years ago, and you went to the bluff and looked out, you would probably see over 1,000 um, oil towers out there. So that shows you how much oil was being uh, pumped out of uh, what we now call Playa Vista and, 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 that, and that whole area. Um, what, what happened to that economy and why? Uh, it all went away because uh, transportation technology changed. You had uh, international competition. Uh, what was it last year that we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Toyota coming into the United States? And uh, they made their entry in via Los Angeles. And what is it? You had the Toyota Pet Crown, which everybody giggled at and said, nobody will ever buy these foreign cars. Uh, and so it's, they've all went away. They, the aircraft factories, we have two, two facilities now making airplanes that can fly out. So one is the Boeing facility down in Long Beach, and then the other one is down in Torrance, Robinson Helicopter. And how many of you have ever heard of Robinson Helicopter? You probably haven't, but uh, they're private, and they're doing a land office business, and a lot of it is international. So what happened to the aerospace industry? I mean, talk about, I mean, we, we produced the, you know, the rockets that uh, sent astronauts to the moon and things of that nature uh -huh. and Downey in different places. Uh -huh. Funny you mentioned Downey. I live in Downey and uh, we So that was a long move from Huntington Park to Downey. I'm a child of the southeast. Uh, it's my natural habitat uh, and I find it more interesting. If offered the choice of going to Beverly Hills or Vernon, I would pick Vernon every time. Okay, not a fun guy to hang out with, just remember that. Farmer John is there, Hoffy, Dodger Ducks. So what, what happened to aerospace? Uh, aerospace went away in the early 1990s. You had uh, the defense industry downsizing, the end of the Cold War. Uh, you had Airbus uh, lurch onto the scene. Uh, and then just the response of people. Uh, we did an analysis and said there was going to be a huge loss of aerospace jobs, and nobody believed us. And unfortunately, it all came true. And those were good quality jobs. And uh, some of the f uh, facilities moved to other states because the cost of doing business in other states was much lower. And then in the case of uh, Lockheed, they moved to Georgia because they had a very aggressive uh, senator. Mm -hmm. And one of the great uh, problems in uh, California, Southern California, is our congressional delegation. It's the largest, but they aren't organized. They're like, um, you know, well, like trying to herd cats is the phrase you would use. 
So you mean that, it, for instance, in Texas, uh, the members of Congress, whether they're Republican or Democrats, get together and they say, what will it take to get a certain defense plan or a certain investment by the federal government in Texas, and they vote that way. Mm -hmm. And in California, especially Southern California, or just the L.A. County alone, mm -hmm. which has more members of Congress than all but 15 states, they could get together and say, we want you to invest in L.A., and they don't. Is that? That's, that's it. Yeah, they don't, and they're very disorganized. But Texas is a wonderful example. They're very focused. Uh, Georgia used to be very, very focused. Uh, so we just sort of sit back, and it's sort of this sort of laissez-faire attitude, uh, you know, what will be will be, but uh, one of the classic examples of this attitude is we are donor state, and you know what that means. Well, I know what that means. Tell the students what that means. Uh, a donor state means that for every dollar we send to Washington in federal taxes, we get back about 70-some-odd uh, cents, and it's really kind of ironic. Uh, you have all these other states saying, well, we need this money more than California, and we don't care about California yet. If California went away, they would feel the pain. So um, we've talked about, when you talk about LA's economy historically, we talked about it being an incredible agricultural county, an incredible uh, fishing county, oil, uh, aerospace, industry, um, and you know, real estate throughout all of that. We have earlier mentioned Hollywood and entertainment. Um, so there are all kinds of different economies that have come and gone. So how do you prepare for what's coming? What, what would be, if you could put together a curriculum for a university, USC, UCLA, Loyola Marymount, uh, wh what would you suggest be part of that curriculum? You'd have to develop a good skills at looking into the future, trying to figure out what's going on in certain industries, what's going on uh, globally. Uh, it would be very, very difficult because most people, you know, they look in the rearview mirror and that's, that's how they see the future, they look in the rearview mirror. But you look at Los Angeles and uh, the classic question I like to ask people, what is the basic industry of Los Angeles? Well, what is the basic industry? Does anybody want to give a guess? Come on. Well, someone said real estate. Well, that's a pretty good answer. Someone, someone said, said film. Or the film industry. Industry. Uh, those are good answers, but the basic industry of Los Angeles is creativity in it's all its guises. And you stop and think, we have three major research universities, Caltech, UCLA, and USC. And only one other metropolitan area in the U.S. can match us, and that's Boston. And then we have things like the Otis College of Art and Design and Arts Center and the Colburn School of Music. So creativity is everywhere. And a lot of people, when they say creativity, they just think, oh, it's the fine and performing arts. That's creativity. It's not. It's the industries that are using brain power to design a dress. Or my favorite example is the Mars rover or the space shuttle. And so you have creativity in science, creativity in consumer products, in the motion picture industry. And so you have to think about that. Uh, can, you, can you be creative? Can you think creatively? Yeah, and it doesn't always have to be cutting edge industries. For instance, many year, for many years, the design of most automobiles for both American and Japanese was actually headquartered here in LA. It so still th is. It still yeah. is. Yeah, you have Toyota and Honda. All the successful auto companies have a design center in Los Angeles. So, so you have the Japanese companies with their oh. design centers here in Los Angeles designing cars that will be built and assembled in Japan or sometimes in the United States now as well, but throughout the, the whole world. And the companies from Detroit as well still have those design centers. So um, when, when, you, when you take a look at the, the leading sectors and creativity is one. So look, even here next to Loyola Marymount University, we have E8 right down the street. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What are some of the other leading sectors? Well, the largest industries, number one, based on employment, is international trade. Uh, and we are the nation's largest customs district. Yeah, uh, but what does that mean? Interna I, get, I heard a couple of students say they wanted to do international trade. What do, what do I do if I want to start in, to get into international trade? You can do many things. You can get into international trade. You can become a customs broker. You can do uh, international trade finance. Uh, you can get into international trade by going to work for an apparel firm or a furniture firm. It's designed here, made overseas, shipped in, and then you have to market it and get it distributed. So you can get in international trade in many ways. And a lot of times people think, well, international trade, it's just some couple of people in a warehouse driving a forklift. That's not it. 
is a lot of what you call the pink collar jobs. Mm -hmm. And then you have tourism, and tourism uh, has a lot of growth potential. Uh, you have the entertainment industry, which is sort of morphing. You'd have to say it's more content, and it can be uh, films, it can be cable TV, uh, video games, uh, then you have technology, and then you have professional business services, which includes law. And at the end of the day, you have to remember that the lawyers always win. The current subprime lending mess is going to create just a bonanza of business for them. So you heard the students talk. You, a lot of them mentioned law. A lot of them mentioned um, urban planning, architecture. Um, what about those type? I mean, how, how do you, there's a lot of lawyers, but the, there's the, the idea that most lawyers make a lot of money. And we know that isn't the case. It, it, it's a tough business. And uh, yeah, think about it. Talk to somebody who is a, uh, an office manager for a law firm. Uh, because every so often, they will tell you that one of the lawyers will go ballistic and scream and throw things and uh, sort of upset the whole staff. We were in space that had been previously occupied by a law firm uh, and there was these strange gouges in the wall and then we asked somebody, what is that from? And people throwing things. So, you know, you think they, were, they all had a Latino temperament. Yeah. So, what do you see in the next, well, are we in a recession? Someone asked that earlier. Yeah. You're, you're wondering about my comment about Latino temperament with the name Kaiser. Yeah. Uh, the birth name is Salas. My mother remarried, so uh, I'm a classic Angelino. All, all mixed up. All mixed up, yeah. Well, are we in a recession? Um, and wait, wait, for the students, there's actually a, a uh, classic definition of a recession. Okay, yeah, you have something called the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they're sort of like wise men, and they will get together when they feel the time is right and say we are in a recession, a lot of people are out there saying, well, it's two quarters in a row of decline in uh, inflation-adjusted GDP, but there are other indicators that people use, that the Bureau uses, and so people are nervous about GDP. We've looked at some of the other indicators, and right now they don't say we're there yet, but regardless of what the definition is, there's a lot of pain out there. If anybody is in housing-related activities, financial services, retailing, uh, it's tough for a lot of people out there. So is Los Angeles in a recession? No. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, well, this time around, we have this strange dynamic in Southern California. Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange County, they like to poke fun at Los Angeles because we're big and we're old and we're stodgy. But this time around, I think uh, we will get through it in a fairly decent way. Now, is there any other place in the country like LA that is diver as diversified economically? No, I really don't think so. You look at uh, New York, they're sweating bullets right now because of the downturn in financial services. Uh, international tourism is helping, is helping them. Chicago is struggling because of a lot of manufacturing. Uh, San Francisco Bay Area right now looks like it's doing fairly well, but uh, remember they're very prone to boom and bust, the tech sector boom and bust, and now a lot of people think that they're going to get caught in an environmental boom and bust. What does that mean? Well, they're going to be the center of the green economy. And, uh, you know, what is the green economy? And if you have to say, if the resources, you're looking for resources in the green economy, most of them are here. If you look at uh, the top engineering firms in the United States, four of the top ten are headquartered in Los Angeles. Hmm. And they have all this uh, environmental expertise. So where is LA's economy weakest? You mentioned financial services. There's not a, what's the, there are very few major banks, if any, that are headquartered in LA. You don't think, I don't think of LA as a financial services headquarters. No, that's a problem we have because a lot of people, well, a lot of people think that San Francisco is the, is the business center of the state of California. Um, ostensibly, you have uh, Wells Fargo Bank headquartered in San Francisco, but the California banking operation is actually in Los Angeles because this is where most of the business is. Our, our largest locally headquartered bank is uh, City National, and then you have East West, uh, but all the major banks have operations here because uh, the business base is small to medium sized firms. This is where you make your money. The one area where Southern California was really good in terms of finances was the mortgage industry, countrywide, uh, AmeriCorp, and all of those. And they're going to have a tough time. Yeah, it, it was, uh, most of them were down in Orange County. And we actually had somebody ask us why. Uh, 
why were all, most of these subprime lenders down in Orange County? And it's sort of hard to figure out. And somebody said, well, Newport Beach is always the classic location for boiler room uh, operations. And then somebody else came up with the name Costa del Fraud. So <laughs> that, that is, that, that is uh, true. Um, in, the, in my class, we were talking about what we called the leading sectors of LA. And you mentioned most of them. But to make it easy for the students to remember for the final exam, I always talk about them as the five T's. And we were talking about trade, mm -hmm. tourism. Mm -hmm. Then we call the, the, this one's kind of made up TV, film, creative entertainment. Yep, um, works. Uh, technology, mm -hmm. and a lot of people talk about Silicon Valley, but and you know it's really LA as well, along with the Silicon Valley and Arlington, DC area, and Boston, and those are the four technology uh, areas. And, and transportation. Well, you love to have professional business services, which includes law, accounting, and the traditional definition by the uh, employment department. You have specialized. Uh, design services, which are people doing design of apparel. This is where the rose parade float designers would be. Uh, computer uh, systems design. Uh, it's really very interesting. And then we have a problem because our top three industries are not well reported by government agencies, international trade, uh, tourism, or movies. And a lot of times people just look, overlook them and they look at more obvious things. Okay, I make the argument that these are our leading sectors because not only are they important to LA's economy right now, but they're going to create a lot of the jobs. So if you're looking for a job, look at, look at these five sectors. But that they're going to be around for a while because we lead not only in, in the LA area, California, regionally, but internationally. Nobody anywhere is uh, close to us in terms of television, film, creative entertainment. Nobody anywhere in the US is close to us in terms of trade or in terms of tourism, when you add all the tourist dollars, when you include Orange County and, and all the others. So these are in truly, in truly leading sectors in, in terms of the economy. Um, but the question to me is then, what is the governmental response to continue to invest in these to make sure that they continue to produce more jobs? They need to make sure that you have art and music in K through 12 education. This is very important. Uh, people don't stop to think about it, but uh, was it somebody did uh, a survey that said if somebody is given Crayolas when they're very young, they can go into art or they can go into science, left brain, right brain. Uh, but you need to have that exposure to art and music uh, in K through 12. And even if these people aren't gonna go into, say, professional type of activities, uh, you have a lot of people here that are very good, what we say, crafts people, mm -hmm. and they can go to community college. You know? And so it's the idea, letting them know what they can do to get this creativity out. There seems to be a, a disconnect when you take a look at LA. On the one hand, we have these incredible leading sectors, these incredible research universities that you talked about, not to mention then you know, Loyola Marymount, Occidental College, Claremont, uh, College. Claremont Colleges, mm -hmm. Pepperdine, all the Cal States, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which are incredible state schools. Um, you have the incredible community colleges, which we just don't really uh, um, understand and promote to the degree that we should. But yet, we have a K through 12 system that is not up to par, or so we're told. What, what's the reality of that? Well, First of all, everybody looks at LA in terms of education as the LA Unified School District, which is a strange beast because they have some prize-winning schools and then they have some very, very dysfunctional schools. But remember, there's a lot of other school districts around in LA County uh, that do a very, very good job of uh, educating students. And you have to say maybe it's because they're smaller. I think maybe LA Unified has gotten too big and it just, uh, you need to break up the beast. Uh, good examples in the southeast area of the county uh, where LA Unified covers uh, Huntington Park, and it covers Bell, and it covers Southgate. And in the city of Downey, we see a lot of what we call refugees from the LAUSD. And uh, my favorite is somebody that was in Southgate, didn't want to go to the uh, Southgate High School, walked a block, caught a bus that dropped him off in front of Downey High School, came when he graduated from Downey. A month before he's ready to graduate, uh, they busted him. Mm -hmm. but said, you know, finish school, and then he came to Loyola Marymount and majored in film and got a Fulbright scholarship. Oh, very cool. Um, but the idea was that he thought he needed a greater opportunity to get out of LAUSD. Yeah. So about 
uh, about a fourth of all K through 12 students are in LA USD in LA County. Yeah, because so, it's more than LA City. Right. It's LA City plus about 20 other cities are, are part of it. You mentioned several of them. So it's tough to dismiss LA Unified though because it's so much factors in. A, the latest estimate that I read is that, and Mayor Villaraigosa talks about this, that 50% of kids who start the ninth grade will not graduate. Mm -hmm. well, what's the real story about that? Because there's a lot of debate about that data. It's, well, I think you do find, unfortunately, a lot of them do not graduate because I think they feel, well, um, we're not going to go to college because it's so much of a focus on no child left behind. And yet, uh, they need to think that they can go out and start their own career. They can go to one of the community colleges, uh, um, buy QuickBooks, and they can start their own business. Uh, and I think this is sort of the way we approach education now. You're not a success unless you go to college. And uh, college is not for everybody. We have right, to be but we have the data is pretty overwhelming that if you yeah. don't go to college, your, your life chances are pretty uh, well, minimal. No, well, no. I mean, if you, you know, say you go to one of the community colleges and you, do, you study automotive repair, and for example, Cerritos College, and uh, they have one of the best uh, auto repair courses around. Uh, they yeah. all graduate with, uh, with jobs. You have computer repair. You need uh, contractors. You need uh, people that can do plumbing. And they teach basic skills. And there's just a lot of jobs out there that you use your hands, but they're honorable jobs. Yeah. With auto repair, given the way some of our students drive, that might be a lucrative business around Loyola Marymount. I know. Um, I almost ran into one uh, in the parking garage. Yeah. OK, I'm um, going to have some uh, students ask some of the, uh, some questions. But uh, in terms of workforce training, we always think about K through 12. We think about community colleges. But what else is the Los Angeles region doing to prepare its people for the jobs of the future? Uh, I don't think they're doing enough. But for example, our people out in the field, when they're talking to a business, they say they want somebody who can read, write, and speak English well. Uh, hopefully they're computer literate. And then they need to have good people skills uh, because a lot of these sectors you're interacting with people and you need to be able to learn how to deal with people of all ra races, all ages, uh, all economic uh, sectors. Uh, I think that's very, very important. So most of the students actually, if they're uh seniors were probably born in 86, 87, 88. Mm -hmm. So when they were in uh, preschool is when we had that uh, period in the 1990s. 89 through 94, 95. Mm -hmm. LA went through a tough period. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned that in 92 we had the riots. Mm -hmm. In 93 we had those great fires and we talked about the fires from last year, but these mm -hmm. fires were even greater than those. In 94, we had the, um, the earthquake. North earthquake. Mm -hmm. So things were getting so bad that the Raiders would rather be in Oakland than LA, and they left in 1995. That's how bad it is. Oakland was better for them than, than LA. That was a bad time. Mm -hmm. um, real estate prices declined. There was a national recession. Mm -hmm. um, compare that period in terms of where we are today. Well, first of all, international trade wasn't on the scene in uh, the early 1990s. It really appeared in 1994, and then that's when we started our recovery. And then uh, a lot of other things happened. Uh, some industries picked so, up. Okay, so why did trade begin in 1994? What happened? What was it, 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 was, it was there previously, but then all of a sudden it became the elephant in the room that you could not ignore. Uh, we, you know, we, we made the bet on intermodalism, uh, containerized uh, traffic. And we had the, the land, and we had uh, the railroad connections to the rest of the U.S. Uh, you know, you go, say, to Oakland, and Oakland is, wants to be a major port, and yet they don't have good rail connections. And 40% of the cargo that comes into the local ports goes elsewhere in the United States. In fact, we did a study once that said every, every state in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, uh, goods that come through the L.A. Long Beach area goes to these areas and then also unfortunately to the uh, District of Columbia. So that means that the you, LA... You didn't get that. We'll make a joke. You know, okay. When I left Omaha to come back to LA, everybody said, oh my God, how can you go back to La La Land? And that's how they viewed us. You know, La La Land, plastic land. And you have to say, no, the real La La Land is inside the Beltway. That's right. Um, every single state then is dependent on the port. 
Mm -hmm. Everybody in the United States, every major city benefits what happens in LA Long Beach. Mm -hmm. Yet many people in Long Beach, LA, Wilmington Harbor area believe that they suffer all the consequences, all the costs, mm -hmm. meaning the pollution, etc. So there's been a major movement by environmentalist labor groups to try to slow down the harbor. There's also movements in terms of trying to uh, um, slow down the growth of LAX. How will that impact the economy? Well, first of all, uh, international trade has been a good uh, generator of good quality jobs. Uh, and you might think about becoming a longshoreman because they earn 100000 a year with wonderful benefits. Uh, but uh, that's Is that better than a lumberjack? Well, much better than a lumberjack. Okay. A little bit, a little dangerous. Um, but basically, what you find in international trade, we look at it as an industry, you know, it's an industry, it's many industries, and they're all sort of like dysfunctional, and they fight among one another, and they don't come up with uh, good solutions to dealing with the pollution and the congestion issues. Let's go back to the question about, if you were a student today, what would you major in, and what, what industry would you be thinking about going into? That's a good question. Um, you know, based, my Bachelor of Science was in Industrial Design. And I think, you know, maybe something design-based, that's the new fad, you know. You don't get an MBA, you have a design-based uh, uh, education. Because you're taught to observe, and I think that's something that's very important. Be observant. And, uh, you know, I love it when somebody wants to drive, because then I'm out there looking at everything and trying to say, what is happening here? Why did this happen? And that's what you have to do. It's uh, Los Angeles is a constantly changing thing. And so observe, because you might learn something valuable about your future life. If you had, I gave you $10 million, that told you you had to invest it in the next three months, and it could only be in LA, what would you invest it in? Right now I'd buy stock in Disney. <laughs> It's an, an L.A. company, it's Burbank an, actually, but... It, yeah. Well, it's an L.A. company, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's the, you know, a lot of people say L.A. and they think it's only city of L.A. Remember, there are 87 other cities out there, and then uh, there's about 120 unincorporated communities that are sizable. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, you have to say Disney is a, is a good play. Um, North Grumman, not too bad. Uh, but if you could give me a few more months, then I'd wait because probably by the end of the year, you'll probably see the bottom of the housing market, and there'll be some incredible bargains. So, what kind of industries have come to you guys, the um, your organization, and said, "We want to move to LA. Can you help us out?" Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a sophisticated photo studio, and they're moving into LA. Uh, we have uh, in a couple of international airlines, an international hotel chain. Uh, you see a lot of different activities. They want to be here because they understand, and maybe people offshore understand us better than we understand ourselves, mm -hmm. is that Los Angeles is a major international business center, and they want to be here because they know the advantages. And uh, you, you learn some strange things. We have probably uh, growth in Chinese tourists looking at us. Uh, they're changing the MOU between the U.S. and China. So uh, Chinese visitors can come. They don't have to come as a study group. And a lot of people say they want to come to Los Angeles and they want to buy something that was designed and made here. So what in, in terms of investment, where if you could get the city government and the county government to invest in what areas, where would you push them toward? Uh, Here, I'm not talking about individuals or corporations, but yeah. the actual gov government. Well, number one, they should look at their land holdings because a lot of government entities own a lot of land which is not being used very well. And so I would uh, have tell them to invest in uh, research on what do they own, and a lot, of, a lot of them don't know what they actually own. And how can you take it to a higher and better use? Because the reality is in the urban core, we've run out of land. And we're going to have to use this land in a more effective fashion. So that speaks a lot to, to urban design, uh, uh, urban policy. Uh, and right now, what we run into is anybody proposes any type of a project, and you have the NIMBYs come out. And you know, all know what NIMBYs are? Not in my backyard. Well, I thought it stood for not Indian, Mexican, black, or young. Oh, no, no, not no. in my backyard. And then you have uh, the notes. Yeah, some of the students finally got it. 
You have the NOPES, you know what NOPES are. NOPES, what is that, N-O-P-E-S? or yeah, not on planet Earth. Not on planet Earth, meaning it'll never get done. Yeah, you don't want anything, and that's what we run into. Uh, any project that's uh, proposed, uh, you have a lot of opposition to it, and uh, you have to sort of back off and say, well, you know, it's not the Los Angeles of the 1920s and the 1930s, it's a much different Los Angeles. So g give me a case of a company that's really uniquely L.A. that grew up, started, and it's, it only it could happen in L.A. What would be a company like that? Please go back to the Walt Disney Company. Oh. Yeah, in fact, uh, they have uh, on their studio lot, they have what they call the Hyperion Cottage, and it was a little bungalow on Hyperion Avenue that that's where the Disney Company really got started, and so they just, you know, Excellent. when they got successful, and, you know, we thank B of A because B of A gave them a loan that uh, bailed them out when they were working on Snow White. Oh. How about, are you familiar with uh, American Apparel? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that company. How, how many of you have heard of American Apparel? Oh, really? How many of you are currently wearing American Apparel? Okay. Did that, uh, did that company exist 10 years ago? No. No, wait, no wait, this, wait. Was, uh, this was the brainchild of Dove Charney, uh -huh. who is... Uh, a little controversial, but he has a lot of good ideas. Well, we don't have to talk about that right, his yeah. controversy right now. But, but uh, Dove Charney is facing a major issue, and that is the I-9 audit letter. What's an I-9? Okay, you guys all know since you're filling some of them out. So tell them about the I-9 letter. An I-9 letter is a letter to a company from the Social Security Administration that says, these employees of yours do not have valid social security numbers. And a lot of those letters are going out to firms in LA. And some of these firms are saying, we don't want a raid. And they're starting to lay people off. And you have to say, this is a threat to our apparel industry, including American apparel, to food, manufacturing, to furniture, the travel and tourism industry. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when American apparel started? Yeah, what, it was a long time ago. And people thought it was, it's not that long ago, but people thought, you're manufacturing sort of basic items here. How can you do it? How are you going to survive? But he created sort of a buzz for it. Right. We had uh, Dove Churney from American Apparel, I think two years ago in, in, at the lecture series. It was quite fascinating. He started American Apparel in, about in the late 90s, mm -hmm. okay, with a couple, you know, just a couple of people. And now there's 4,000 employees in downtown LA. At the very same time that um, apparel industries are leaving America and going to abroad, mm -hmm. uh, what we call offshoring, he was actually building an incredibly large company here in LA and actually paying workers a living wage, living wage. paying them higher than two or three times higher than the typical apparel worker. And people were saying, how could he do this? And he was making t-shirts. Yeah, something yeah. basic, but he, he, he found the magic formula. And the interesting thing is, what was the building that he is in right now? What was it previously used for? It was a produce mart building. Right, yeah. right. And so the old Rykoff building. Yeah, and see how things change. And uh, Los Angeles is constantly evolving, but we get afraid of change. But the key point about American apparel is not so much that it's apparel. I would almost put it with what you were talking about before. It's in the creative mm -hmm. nature, in terms of the design and the cut and the fact that he walks around, watches young people at colleges and other places, what they like to wear, and he immediately designs something, mm -hmm. goes back with his designers that are in that building, and they design it and they cut it and they have it out within a month. And so for him to take it to China, he would have to send the design to China, it would have to be cut over there, he would have to make sure there's quality control, then it would be sent back here on a boat, mm -hmm. and it would take three or four times the length. Exactly. And so he wouldn't keep up with the culture of what you guys are all about, what you guys like to wear. So he watches you, two points that you made, creative and he observes. And what's made, I mean, he's a manufacturer, mm -hmm. but really it's his social science abilities to observe and his creative abilities to design mm -hmm. that have led that company. Not necessarily, it's not uh, just the manufacturing component. Yeah, and he could do it in LA because of the open attitude that we have. And uh, one of the most interesting things, if you can find something that was done about the founding fortunes, the founding families of Los Angeles, uh, if you look at, uh, at these people, most of them were just a couple of steps ahead of the law. And they got to Los Angeles and 
we don't care about where you came from, what your background is. Can you do something interesting? And that's, I think, is the real genius of Los Angeles. Okay, do we have any questions from uh, students, faculty, staff? So let's start with Dr. Magdabosco and then Cynthia, and then we'll go right on down the line, okay? Recently, there was a report released on workforce development and training in Los Angeles that included 100 recommendations. That is what we generically refer to as the EJNC report. Uh, it's, it was put together by a committee of people organized by uh, Mayor Villaraigosa, the Economy and Jobs Committee, and they have 100 suggestions at uh, what can be done to improve the economy of the city of Los Angeles. And it's literally, it's sort of like a blueprint mm -hmm. for how we grow our economy. And um, this is an interesting point. There is no economic development strategy currently for the county of Los Angeles. And that's a major point. In other words, how do we, how does government work with the private sector to improve the private mm -hmm. sector when they don't have a plan, a strategic plan, or anything? Yeah. And then uh, the city of Los Angeles, you can say the EJNC committee, uh, you know, that is sort of an economic development plan, except unfortunately they have nothing about tourism in there. Yeah, so, you know, what do you say? But, you know, some of the cities out there get it. And at the EDC, about two years ago, we started a program to select the most business-friendly city in Los Angeles County. And uh, the most business-friendly city, the first uh, awardee was the city of El Segundo which uh, has the most Fortune 500 headquarters of any area in Los Angeles County. And then this past year, it was the city of Lancaster, but you had like Long Beach, uh, Santa Clarita, um, El Segundo sits it out. But the idea is look at what these cities are doing. They are trying to be responsive to business, and it's a very good lesson. But in, a, in an interesting way, isn't the challenge for LA to be responsive to business more difficult than it is a typical city like Omaha? in that we have so many leading sectors, so many different companies, whereas in many regions, they have one economy and it's easy for them to say, hey, in Detroit, we gotta protect the auto industry. We know what our, I mean, we know it's a dying industry, but yet we're gonna do everything to try to protect this industry. Mm -hmm. Here, we let industries die, mm -hmm. and new ones, it, it, so it's a very different type of a challenge. But even the city of LA could be uh, more responsive to uh, just individual businesses going in a uh, classic example is uh, a baking company called Delilah Bakery, and they took us. They had a 600 square foot space in Echo Park, which was 600 some, square foot. That's not very large. That's not very large. Uh, she went to uh, that's building, like a classroom size, or yeah. yeah. And she went to Building and Safety, and the first thing Building and Safety said, "Oh, well, we think you should tear down the building and put in a structure with underground parking." So that would basically everything that she would make for the next. Ten years we, we Ten years, do that. Yeah, and, and, and you know, if you were in Echo Park, look up Delilah Baker. We can verify that the cupcakes are killers. Cynthia. Hi. Um, I just received an article about high school graduation rates in Los Angeles, and one of the researchers claimed that the solving problems that can be solved within the next decade. I wonder if you think that's feasible, and how would you get there? Would you say that music education is important? Do you think we have a funny problem the way that we find some of our institutions? Yeah, I think the, the big problem with the high school graduation rate is a lot of the students really don't see any future for them. They just, you know, they, they're not, you don't have the good interaction that you used to have between business and education, because I remember years and years and years ago when I was in uh, junior, well, yeah, high school, we had a career day, and literally students went to businesses and they got to see what was going on. We don't do that anymore. And it's sort of like business needs to step up and uh, have students come in for a day and see what goes on. And, and you know, a lot of business, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges, but we need to have this better interaction between business and government. But I think what you do find is a lot of times government is hostile to business. They view business as a problem, whereas the reality is that business is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what does business do? Business creates jobs, they generate tax revenue. Um, government doesn't generate tax revenue. Uh, Jacqueline, you had a question? Hi, I've been uh, talking with a lot of buyers of the market. What do you think is the bottom point of the real estate market? Yes. Oh, 
<laughs> the bottom of the real estate market. And you said wait to take the year, yeah. you said? Well, basically what you do is start looking now because there's a huge inventory of resale homes out there. Uh, there's a lot of new product that's coming on the market. Um, so I think probably at the end of the year you'll start to see some bottoming out. The key thing is can you qualify for a loan because all of a sudden uh, lending institutions have discovered a new four-letter word, R-I-S-K, and Risk. they forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And the joke used to be is that uh, pulse loans, do you know what a pulse home loan is? If you have a pulse, you can get a loan. Yeah. No, but if you can, I would go out and get qualified for a mortgage loan right now. And remember, you're going to have to put money down. But, uh, you know, it's going to be probably towards the end of the year in L.A. County, but if you go out to Riverside, San Bernardino, they've got a rough road ahead of them. Now, the um, term rate, right, I mean, I've heard predictions of four years to start, you know, at the level that it was like two years ago. How long do you think that it will be in the market? Okay. okay, well, right now we're down about 23% from the peak uh, home price in L.A. County. It's going to go down more. Uh, it's going to take a while, and everybody says when we get to the recovery, and there's a lot of people out there, oh, when we get to the recovery, and I think a lot of people feel that the recovery is going to, oh, well, it's going to be double-digit price increases, it's going to be double-digit unit sales. No. No. So it's, it's going to be a much different housing market, but save your money. A lot of young people said, oh, we'll never be able to live in Los Angeles, and there's a lot of opportunities out there. Well, that was one of the major uh, difficulties of mm -hmm. recruiting people to come to mm -hmm. L.A. I know at Loyola Marymount University, mm -hmm. I would say of the last five um, search committees that I've been on, that uh, the number one person that we wanted to hire, we made him a job offer, etc., with a salary that was above the national average, mm -hmm. but yet they made a calculation that it would cost them too much to come to LA in terms mm -hmm. of a, a home, and we lost those people. Mm -hmm. um, and then those that we have hired uh, needed to go out because you couldn't buy a home in Westchester or uh, Manhattan Beach, and you see a, a great distinction between the uh, older faculty, uh, like F Bob Singleton, and the younger faculty, like me, no, I'm kidding, the older <laughs> faculty, and, and, and the younger faculty, that all the old faculty, or more senior faculty live around LMU, mm -hmm. and all the new faculty live far away. Okay. And there's a, there's a great distinction. Yeah, there's just a lot of disconnects out there. But, um, you know, you look around, it, it, in some areas the home prices are getting down to where they are affordable, and then you can always take a chance and go into an area that's sort of transitional, like Echo Park is sort of transitional, but now Echo Park is uh, starting to uh, come back. Uh, there's a lot of areas that uh, you look at what, you know, years ago they weren't hip and now they are, you know, very, very hip. Well, like West Hollywood. You know, West Hollywood used to be where all the maids lived on the, the west side. Now, uh, West Hollywood, they like to make the joke that, uh, well, uh, Beverly Hills is West Hollywood adjacent. But uh, the idea is that uh, look in areas that maybe are not that traditional and you might be surprised uh, at what you find. Yeah. Let me ask you about downtown and then also this I don't know if it's a myth but people always say look if you build the stadium it will improve the region and there have been many cities uh, St. Louis for instance uh, stole the Rams from uh, Anaheim built this incredible stadium and they wanted it as a way that it would rejuvenate mm -hmm. okay does that work no, you have people out there that say, oh, uh, you know, NF NFL franchise is right. a wonderful way, and uh, they're unhappy that we can't get the NFL interested in the Coliseum, and there's, I think people are still thinking, how can we get an NFL team? And maybe the NFL t doesn't want a team in Los Angeles because they use this as leverage. And when one of these smaller cities says, well, we need, you know, the team says we need a new stadium, and if you don't build us one, we'll move to L.A., and then the other benefit of an NFL team is you get the Super Bowl every so often. Yeah. And people say, oh, well, it's $250 million injection into the economy. But there are revisionist sports economists that said, no, it's more like about $50 million. And you have to say, OK, um, you know, a rose parade, the whole, the whole shebang, the parade, the game, and everything, that generates about $250 million. Uh, the tournament has done a study on it. And uh, the Academy Awards, about $130 million. So, uh, do we really need a professional football team to make people 
pay attention to L.A. Um, well, I think second tier cities needed it for name. I, to become a big league city, you needed a big league team, but the LA doesn't necessarily. So, the well, what we have big league teams. Uh, you have uh, the Lakers and the Clippers and the Kings and you. Okay, you said the Lakers. Yeah, and the Do the Cl and you have the, the you know the Dodgers. Yeah. And then we have. They haven't uh, won a World Series in 20, 20 years. Oh, but the, when they did, it was wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and then we have the semi pros UCLA for basketball and USC for football. Right. And, you know, USC. Yeah, notice we didn't mention Loyola Marymount University basketball. But uh, anyway. Um, so the, the, the conventional wisdom was that a NFL team and a stadium would revitalize things. Much research has shown that just not the case. No. Detroit, okay. Detroit is struggling. Uh, St. Louis is struggling. The Buffalo Bills—they're uh, having trouble building, you know, building their, keeping their audience. And uh, no, it, it's that's you know, uh, NFL. It's not going to change your economic fortunes. Okay, so let's talk about downtown LA though. Um, downtown LA has changed dramatically, mm -hmm. including Staples Center. Mm -hmm. So had, has it helped there? Oh, it's definitely helped. Uh, one of the ironies of downtown is they have all these successful restaurants, but then they haven't gotten the other retail to come along. But you look at what's happening in L.A. and right now downtown. There's some controversy about the housing market. Yeah, it has softened up. But you look at uh, the L.A. Live with the Convention Center Hotel. Uh, at last, we will get our Convention Center Hotel. Uh, 20 years we have waited and then you have the Grand Avenue project and that's going to change the face of downtown uh, but it's not going to be I think the boosters of downtown they said well we're going to have a downtown it'll be like downtown New York or it's going to be like Chicago the Magnificent Mile no our downtown is going to be uh, a different downtown and the key strategic mistake that they made is that they have stuff scattered all over and they don't have a critical mass and uh, you know, from classic redevelopment. Here's your core, and then you go out a couple of blocks, put down a couple of stakes, fill in between them. They didn't do that. It's just scattered all over the place. Scattered within downtown, you mean? Oh yeah. And their definition of downtown is really big. I mean, uh, so you, you, you can't walk. From, you can walk from Grand Avenue to um, LA Live, but it's a walk. It's a walk. And remember that in, in California, we're car oriented, so we park our car. car and then we'll walk a couple of blocks one way, a couple of blocks the other way, but then if it's any further than that, uh, get in the car and then sometimes go. Okay, so Staples Center is considered the most successful stadium ever built. Mm -hmm. I mean, by far, by any, why? Yeah, well, state of the art, uh, really wonderful, and then you look at the package that they- Let me ask the students, how many, how many of you have been to Staples Center? Okay. That's about everybody. Yeah, did you eat downtown? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, but, uh, no, you look at the package that they've created at LA Live, and so you have Staples Center, and then you have the Nokia Theater, which is scooping up uh, a lot of award shows. They just got the Emmys. They have something called the Club Nokia, which will be a 2,000-seat venue that's not open yet, so they can offer you an array of things. And then right next to it, you have the Convention Center Hotel that will have the largest ballroom in the city, even larger than the Hyatt Regency Century Plaza. And uh, I'll make you a bet, uh, in five years, uh, you'll have another visitor to downtown. And who will that be? Think of a little gold man. All the uh, Oscars. Mm -hmm. So leaving the Kodak theater. Yeah, it's a smaller house. So they have to block off the street in front of the Kodak when they have the Academy Awards, which makes the neighbors an unhappy. You can block off Chitkern Court and nobody will care. Yeah. And the Kodak theater, I think, is... Um, 3,000 seats. 3,000 seats and Nokia is... Seven. So, okay, so more of us can go to the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. so the, uh, what, what do we do with the Kodak theater then? The Kodak Theater has the Cirque du Soleil in there. They oh, can go, right. uh, you know, 365. So there'll be a new Cirque du Soleil show every 24 hours a day there at the... Uh, so yeah. he's and, got all and, the answers here. And interesting things happening because, you know, Wicked is going to be closing at the end of the year and they've done a two-year run in Los Angeles. And the only reason they're closing is that they had a subscription ser series at the theater and they have to move it because, uh, you yeah. know, 
you know, you could put a, a show in like uh, Wicked if you find something that was really well, good. Kind of like what's going on in Broadway. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, politically speaking, you talk about LA being unfriendly politically. Okay, I don't get that. How, how does that work? Why, why wouldn't Mayor Viragoso or Councilman Rosendahl or Councilman Perry in downtown be friendly to business? It's not the elected officials, it's the bureaucracy. And you have to deal with building and safety, you have to bid, uh, deal with uh, LA Department of Water and Power, you have to deal with the County Health Department. And you have strange little things. Have you ever heard of the Fog Agency? The Fog Agency? The Fog Agency. If you have any type of food service, you have to deal with fog. Fat soil and grease. Uh -huh. And you have to be careful of the discharge. And uh, fog held up uh, the Delilah Bakery. And uh, so you have a lot of things. And it's, it's not the elected officials. They're friendly. But it's just the bureaucracy. And you get uh, hung up in things. And sometimes you can have a building inspector come in and say, you need to do this. And then you'll get your permit. So you do it. And then a couple of But aren't of weeks they doing their job by saying you need to do this following the rules that the council <laughs> passed? But it's the interpretation. Because then you can have a different building inspector come in after a couple of weeks and say, why did you do that? Well, the old inspector told me I had to do that. No. Yeah. So talk to me about labor and the labor unions. I mean, historically, Los Angeles was known as an anti-labor uh, city, um, even to the point where you know, the labor strife that occurred, the, the infamous bombings of the LA Times, and the, the, uh, the, those uh, um, labor activists were actually convicted and uh, um, executed. So um, everybody is for historically a long time known that LA was just not friendly to labor. But now LA is considered the heart of labor and the labor movement in the United States. What happened? Uh, it's labor trying to literally survive. And you stop and think of history in the United States. And at one time you had the mine workers and the mine workers could go on strike and it would cripple the economy. Where are the mine workers? Then you had uh, the railroad unions, the steel workers, the auto industry and labor in private sector has really struggled. So the unions are looking at basically public sector or lower skilled jobs. And they're trying to uh, sort of reinvent themselves, revitalize themselves. And you have to say, is it going to work or is this the last gasp? Talk about what's going on on Century Boulevard and LAX. Uh, the the uh, labor unions are mm -hmm. trying to organize the um, hotel workers, mm -hmm. and uh, some of those hotels have been resistant, mm -hmm. but now the city's somehow trying to get involved. Well, they, they're requiring them to uh, pay a living wage because they benefit from LA International Airport. And so that's the logic that's being used there. And it's going to be interesting because it's being challenged by business and they're mm -hmm. bringing lawsuits. And uh, well, look at the port uh, of LA with the port truckers situation. And they want to have the truckers get clean, clean trucks, but uh, in the port of LA, you have to work for a concessionaire, which means that you can be organized by the Teamsters. Yet, if you go next door to the port of Long Beach, um, it's still you know they will buy the uh, port truckers a clean, a clean modern truck, but then they can remain independent truck drivers. So, but going back to LAX and Century Boulevard, which is real close by here to Loyola Marymount University, the, the what is the status right now? What's going on right now? I think they're still, you know, sort of talking, maybe offline, trying to figure what each side does next. And what they say is that, well, uh, the airports along Century Boulevard have some of the highest occupancy rates in the city, and that's true. But their room rates are not uh, as high as they, well, at least they should be. But the idea is that Century Boulevard, that's where you would fly in if you're doing a one-day business trip, meeting somebody. Um, it's not, what would you say, a garden spot. No. But so, that, that one strange build uh, operation is still there. Right. right. Let me ask uh, a couple more questions here. Cornelius and then Dr. Blakesley. Who else will be here? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Yeah, business taxes, and there was a big fight over whether we should use the business, you know, lower the business tax where the city lose revenue. And that, you know, they have consolidated a lot of the things, uh, trying to make it more user friendly. But still, it's a major hurdle for getting uh, businesses to locate in Los Angeles, especially when you have really user friendly businesses or cities right next door, like right. Burbank. Uh, but explain gross receipts to the students. Uh, well, you pay taxes on your receipts, so you can pay retaxes on a variety of things. You have uh, 
utility taxes and the city's gross receipts tax based on uh, your revenue can be quite onerous, especially if you're a small business. So, for instance, if you have a, um, a law firm mm -hmm. and you charge and you you know, made uh, or you charged a million dollars, mm -hmm. you would have to pay the tax on that, even mm -hmm. though you may have spent, you might have spent like 800000 or 900000 for that business that's here. You really only made $100,000, let's yeah. say. Yeah. But they're charging you a tax on the million, not the 100. So the gross receipts is everything that you brought in, even though you might not have made that much. Yeah, and, and one of the big problems was that companies were cl classified in multiple tax categories. And, the, you know, and talk about a headache, you know, yeah. great business for the accountants, but they were in multiple categories, and that was in a, uh, a cost to them. Dr. Uh, Blakesley? Uh, last, I believe it was last week, the uh, Census Bureau reported on population changes in U.S. counties, and they reported an unexpected decline, I think it was around 2,000 people in between 2006 and 2007. And I heard Joel Cotton uh, last week on, it was actually this week, on Which Way LA, uh, National Public Radio, and he was suggesting this is basically a good thing that we're starting to experience a population decline because we'll very unlikely never be able to produce enough affordable housing and middle class jobs for all the new arrivals. Um, I, I wonder, do you think this is going to be just a short uh, change in the population uh, uh, that's been taking place here in Los Angeles? Do you think this so is good or bad? Yeah. So no, we lost people then. The lost. Census Bureau says we lost 2,000 people July 06 to July 07. Um, we love the Census Bureau, but uh, their population numbers are off. We use the State Department of Finance population numbers, and they showed from 06 to 07 we added 46,000. And then Census says, I think we're not quite at 10 million yet. Uh, the Department of Finance says uh, we're pretty close to 10.3 million. And uh, so who's right? DOF is right. Department Which of Finance. State. Now, why? Yeah. How do they count as because opposed to the census? They do a more rigorous job. Remember, the government statistical agencies haven't had their budgets increased for many years, and that means they have less money to gather the statistics. Uh, so this is a real problem. DOF does a better job. And one thing that I notice. When you drive around, DOF is the Department, Department of, of Finance, Finance Demographic the Research Unit. And, and if you go to that, that website, website, you can, you can get can, the numbers. Right. For uh, every little city and everything. And exactly. Yeah. yeah, but one thing that you notice, do you see a lot of Florida license plates around? What are they doing here? A lot of Texas license plates are around. You can register your car in Texas and live in California. I know people that do it. The only thing you have to do is go to Texas every year and take a defensive driving course. And so there's a lot of guerrilla residents in Los Angeles. I, I, I yeah, swear to me. Why, why would you do that? Because it's save, cheaper? Save money. Oh, you're busted. So what does that mean? How much could you save? You save money on insurance. Uh, you save you know, money on the auto registration fee. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Not everybody's mm. thinking about it. Do I know anybody in, uh, in, in, in Texas? So, yeah. Any other uh, um, questions or, or, or comments oh, over there in the back? That we'll, Dr. Singleton, and then we'll go back there. Pardon? What are the plans for the people who are living in Skid Row? Unfortunately, no plans for the people living on Skid Row. That's a very controversial subject. Uh, a lot of the people have severe psychological problems. Um, you know, when I leave the office, I drive east on 6th Street, and uh, you see it real, you know, you know that they have problems. And yet, you know, there have been proposals to build uh, shelters for these people in other areas of the county rather than downtown, and the NIMPYs come out not in my backyard. But isn't it better to keep them downtown where there are more social services, where it's more concentrated and we can deal with it? Uh, some people say, yeah, that makes more sense. But then other people, the downtown boosters, say, no, that's putting an unfair burden on downtown. Uh, but this is because you know some people want to push downtown further east, and mm -hmm. you start to get uh, what we call the grinding of the te tectonic plates. And uh, right. but uh, there's a lot of what would you say uh, hype in the downtown residential uh, market because you hear. People talk about the Little Tokyo Lofts. Where's the Little Tokyo Lofts? They're on San Pedro Street, just north of Fifth Street. 
which means that they're more like the Skid Row lofts rather than the little Tokyo yeah, lofts. But they're still going for several hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars. Well, according to multiple listing service, year over year, uh, the condos in downtown LA are down in price by about 23 percent. Hmm. So, but in downtown LA, every day about half a million people drive in, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. About four or five years ago, only 10,000 people lived there. Now 40,000 people live there. That's more like 30. Okay, 30. They, they, so they, 10, 10 to 30, okay? Mm -hmm. But many of those kind of, in a sense, taking issue with Dr. Sing Singleton in that didn't most of the, the, the people who moved in, they didn't displace um, any uh, homeless or, or did they, were they new buildings or, or were they buildings that had previously housed people and they kicked the people out, redid it, and, and, and uh, no, had no. a bunch of yuppies move in. You only had a couple of instances of that, a couple of the hotels, and they were on their case. But basically, they were adaptive for use of older office buildings. They were you know, early 1900s uh, office buildings that didn't meet uh, current code. And so they did adaptive reuse, so you can recycle those buildings for uh, residential use. Uh, they well, you know, pulled back on parking requirements. So. Uh, Homeless weren't displaced, but you have a lot of the residences and areas where they interface with uh, the homeless people. And uh, you know, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, at Fifth and Flower in the heart of downtown, you can run into some pretty aggressive uh, homeless people uh, wanting money. But who who moves to downtown? Who are the new twenty thousand residents? Any hey, any of you students live downtown? Anybody live downtown? It's kind of a commute, so no. Anybody live downtown? Where did okay. you live? Sixth and Main. Sixth and Main. Okay. That's Skid Row. Uh, Santa Fe Lofts or Pacific Electric? That's Pacific Electric. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's, they tend to be young, younger, upwardly mobile professionals, uh, almost 100,000, pretty diverse uh, careers. Uh, so this is interesting. But one of the interesting things is a lot of these people in a couple of demographic surveys that have been done they were asked, would you be living in downtown in five years? And a lot of them said no, because if you're going to start a family, right. yeah. So it's a transition period. It's, it's you, a transition. You go while you're young. There's a lot of restaurants. There's Staples Center, Nokia, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. the Edison, the Golden Gopher, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's, what, that, that's what young people want. Yeah. It's, and you know, old people don't want that. No. You know, the geezer okay. set doesn't want it. Yeah. You know. uh, Danny. Hi. Um, um, you mentioned the uh, International Trade of Black Money right now uh, in terms of uh, job market. Um, recently, there's been news about Miranda. Um, what, what are the gains and opportunities in terms of uh, you know, NAFTA and the future for that market? Okay, that's, well, remember that who was talking about NAFTA? It's the, the presidential candidates and uh, they're catering to Michigan and Ohio, which have really been whacked by uh, uh, the downturn in the auto well, industry. Tom, yeah. mention to the students what NAFTA is. North American Free Trade Agreement, Canada, Mexico, and the US, and uh, favorable tariffs and what have you. And uh, I think there'll be a lot of discussion about it as we get closer to the election. Uh, but after the election is over, there probably won't be that much uh, much change. You know, you're not supposed to wish your life away, but I can hardly wait for January 2009. Or just November just to uh, get, get that over with. So has NAFTA been good for LA or not? No, I think NAFTA has been good for LA. Uh, for example, you have a lot of assembly plants uh, in Mexico and a lot of the components come in through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, Laredo, Texas ranks as in the top 10 Customs District in the United States. Is LA and number one? LA is number one, uh, with the fifth largest port complex uh, in the globe. But anyway, what's, what's happening? Containers come in, they're put on trains uh, at Long Beach or Los Angeles and taken down, and uh, they go through Laredo and into the Mexican industrial heartland. So, hey, do we have, I know we had a question back there. Go ahead, Paulina. In the meantime, let me ask you Has immigration been good for Los Angeles or not? Now that's a third real question. Of course, but we asked it in our survey. I can't remember the actual mm -hmm. results. I do actually have them right over here, but mm -hmm. what do you, I mean, from an economic perspective, have immigrants been good or bad? I mean, we know their costs, we know their benefits, but taken as a whole. They've been good. And, and what leads you to say that? 
Just observation and surveys. We did a survey for the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute, uh, and we surveyed small manufacturing companies with a predominantly uh, Latino workforce, and they had productivity that was wonderful. And they said the, the workers are very loyal, very hardworking. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, people probably want to beat me up, but uh, no, they've been good. They have been good because these, to come here, these people took a risk. They left uh, family behind, and uh, they're sending money back to uh, their home country, and these people that have uh, the invalid uh, Social Security numbers, they've been depositing money into the Social Security account, and they'll never be able to claim it. So we asked the question, overall, do you think immigrants have a positive or negative influence on our economy? These students all remember that question. And 64% uh, of Angelinos believe that immigrants have had a positive. Only 17% it was negative, and 14% don't know. And when you do it, divided by region in terms of the city and the valley, it's almost identical. Uh, exactly, there was no distinction between the valley and the rest of the city. When you divide it by race, Obviously, you Latinos and Asians were a little bit more supportive. Seventy-nine percent of Latinos and seventy percent of Asians believed that immigrants had a positive impact. Whites, sixty-three percent believed that they had a positive impact. Only eighteen percent of whites believed that uh, immigrants had a, a negative. The big difference is African Americans. Thirty-three percent believed it was negative, and thirty-nine percent believed. Uh, excuse me, thirty-three percent believed it was positive and 39 believed that it was uh, negative. The only other demographic group that had those similar numbers were Republicans. 38% believed it was positive and 43 negative. Kind of strange uh, group. You never, hardly ever see African American public opinion mirror Republican public opinion. Yeah, that's very strange. But remember, uh, everybody looks at South Los Angeles mm -hmm. and that's uh, an African American stronghold, but it's not if you go down there. Uh, it's a Latino stronghold, and um, you know I have. Well, for example, you have uh, the Burke seat on the uh, Board of Supervisors coming up for election, and I ask uh, a friend who's a city councilman for the city of Huntington Park, Juan Noguez, uh, and he said, "Well, you know, yeah, you know, you, you know, it would make sense, but not that many people are registered to vote in South Los Angeles." Yeah, I'd like to always point out to my students that. Uh, uh, we think of Watts, Inglewood, and Compton as mm -hmm. uh, black uh, communities, but They're all of them are now majority Latino. Yeah. Year. So I know we have another question over there. Hi, I'm um, 1881 regarding the disaffiliation of William Z was proposed in the state of California in 2005 and due to immense opposition by Rita Jackson, the United Teachers of Los Angeles Union, the bill has undergone alterations and was finally chapter in September 2006. I think she might be working on a paper. Yeah. And so, so what, what's the what's the bill again? Yeah, but what what was it supposed to do? Oh, you mean, you mean break it apart? Yeah, I'd, I'd break LAUSD. No, you would, but what do you think the chances are? Probably not uh, slim and none. And why not? Why? why uh, I mean, I think, I'll, I'll look, I'm a LAUSD graduate, mm -hmm. okay? For many, many years, I said, no way would we break up that school district. That's, you know, it did, a, from my perspective, mm -hmm. it did me well. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was easy to beat up on the school mm -hmm. district uh, for, and not give it resources, et cetera. And so I was a knee-jerk supporter of LAUSD and keeping it that way. I've now made a 180 degree turn and believe it needs to be broken up, mm -hmm. okay? Well, I graduated from uh, LAUSD elementary school and it was good. Uh, but, you know, you look at LAUSD and I think the bureaucracy has gotten too big and it's very, very slow moving. And uh, here again, observation, when you go to government entities, you watch the people that work there. And if you go to the LAS USD headquarters, you know, they're sort of hanging out in front, smoking a cigarette, what have you. You don't sense any great urgency. But it's not going to be broken up. It'll be very, very difficult. Uh, not why? I, the unions, I think, would oppose it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of the smaller cities that would like to get out of it. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Because we have time for about one or two questions. Cornelius, you had a question? 
Well, the question I already had about the mayor I think over the school is wouldn't the mayor the influence of the great power again, we don't have power over the LUS independent domain who we'll pass it over the schools, who will pay that back? A lot of those questions aren't being asked. Now, it's, it's going to be interesting. The mayor wants to... Well, why don't you repeat the question, because... Uh, What's well, about the take, you know, the mayor having more influence over LAUSD, and uh, it's sort of like, okay, getting performance out of the, uh, out of the schools. And I say, you look at LAUSD, and you go out into the West Valley, and they have award-winning schools. And then you look at some of the schools in the inner city, and... Uh, yeah, it, they're just not doing it. And some people say, well, you, you don't have the involvement of the parents, especially in uh, the immigrant neighborhoods, because okay. the parents are out working. In many cases, they're working a couple of jobs. And let's see, that's very important. So you, you need the parental involvement. And also, I think you need business to step back in and let these kids know there are wonderful jobs out there for you if you graduate from school and have those key skills. Well, Jack Kaiser, it's been great having you here at Loyola Marymount University. We appreciate it. Okay, gang, we'll see you next week. And remember, next week we're down, back down in our usual uh, location. Uh, have a good week.